morning we're going to be in Revelation 16. And the last time we were together in Revelation, the message was titled The Reality of the Two Paths, and it is reality. I mean, you know, we're seeing interesting things happening in our world. We're seeing a godless world. We're seeing a remnant of those that have decided to follow Christ, even through all the difficulties. But in the, in the book of Revelation, what we start to see is uh, the future play out before us as if it was the past. But see, only God can do that. He can see the future. But in the reality of the two paths, we keep seeing the scene in heaven with the saints having a really great time. You know, this is another thing that this, all these ideas that are false about the scripture, are false about God. You know, some people think, wow, heaven, hell's going to be a great place where I get to party with my friends, and heaven is going to be a boring place. But actually, when you look at the scene in heaven, it's an awesome place. People are rejoicing, they're happy, there's joy, the Lord is there, they're praising, there's excitement. So heaven's going to be a really, really cool place. But we, we start to see everything fold out on the earth in the earth's future, and the saints or those who have trusted in Christ in this place, this big party together in the heavenlies, and the sorrow and the sadness of those that still continue to reject God and try to make their utopia on this earth or the temporal things. Uh, today, the message is titled The Bowl Judgments, and you could think of like a cereal bowl or a, the word can be translated a flask or a vial, V-I-A-L, and the angels pour these flasks or vials onto the earth and you see the rest of these judgments take place. Now, I, I think sometimes, even in American culture, we almost disassociate ourselves from the Bible. And in other words, I have people say to me all the time that they love Revelation, they rov love Revelation, but I don't know that that many people are paying attention to current events. You know, because the Bible, especially Revelation, has to be applied. This could be happening five years from now, 10, from, 10 years from now, 15, we don't know. But I think I've made the case over the last 16 chapters about the rise of globalism, about the Antichrist, about the mark of the beast, about this centralized system, which the earth and human beings now have the technology to track its citizens, to uh, electronically you know, find out where everybody is, what they believe, what they think. I mean, we've gone through big tech, we've gone through so many things. And the rise of this globalist movement forcing us into a scenario where it will, will be a platform for the Antichrist. You know, I'm not, you know, I, I, and some churches do this, and I don't specifically speak about one party or the other as far as political parties, but even when we go to vote, we have to think about, you know, we have the traditional issues that Christians are concerned about, but do we ever think about which candidate wants to thrust us into this global movement to the extent that it takes away our Bill of Rights, our amendments, because the big picture, the needs of the many, is so much more important than the needs of the few. And they'll use these terms to basically bring us into a system where we're just little pieces of the machine. You know, the machine is what's important. So when we go through the scripture, you have to start thinking about what we're dealing with today, especially as we go into Babylon and we go into this monetary system and we go into this this trade system. This is all in the scripture folks Hold on to your seats because it's going to get very interesting. We're going to look at this in five parts So jumping in in verse 1 it Says then I heard a loud voice from the temple now this would be in heaven Right the temple on the earth was just a copy of what God had already established in heaven saying to the seven angels go and pour out the bowls or the the flasks of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So one out of five is the first bowl judgment. And you can picture the scene. The voice comes from this temple in heaven. You can see the Lord himself directing his angels, now's the time. Now's the time to pour out those flasks. You know, sometimes when we pray things, and I listen, we, we are almost in a bubble in the United States. You know that how many Christians, and you don't see this in the mainstream media, do you know how many Christians in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, are being persecuted overseas where they don't have the protections that we have in the United States? We have brothers and sisters that are suffering 
They're, they're taking, their livelihoods are taken away. If it's a, an agrarian situation or a farming community, they're forced not to go to the well where everybody else goes. I mean, this is bad news. So God, this justice is a good thing because our brothers and sisters right now that we're going to be in, e in eternity with, think about this, we'll never meet them here probably, they're suffering. And what's happening to them is unfair and the world just doesn't care. It's not on their agenda. So... He directs his angels to do this. So the first judgment brings a foul and loathsome sore only on those having the mark of the beast. What does that tell you? Not everybody has the mark of the beast. Now, I worked in local government for 25 years, and so, you know, I just, it's just the way my mind works. It's, it's childlike in that as a child, I look at the scripture, and I'm like, Daddy, you know, how is this going to play out? But I also have experience. And people say, well, this is an ultra-authoritarian, and it is. It's a globalist system. But again, I worked for local government. We had disasters, hurricanes, floods, power outages, and we had to get people, especially disabled people, their electricity for their oxygen. We had to move people. And it's a tough thing in local government. Let me put that aside. This global government is going to institute and force this mark of the beast. Well, in a sense, you will decide whether you want it or not, but it's gonna take a long time to implement. There's 7.8 billion people on the planet, and this isn't going to happen overnight. Um, for those that are left that maybe didn't accept Christ as their Savior when the church is gone, they're going to start to think about things, maybe some of your loved ones, and they're going to think about what you told them about the Scripture. And when the mark of the beast comes, they're going to say, you know what, put me last in line. I, I remember what my loved one said. This is bad news. So there's going to be those that are going to be on, in the front of the line. This is great. Anything that government does, any control, and you see people doing that today. The government says, hey, we're, we're doing it for you, and everybody runs to the front of the line. And that's what's going to happen. But the Bible's very clear. When you take the mark of the beast, you're also worshiping this antichrist, this global, charismatic, articulate person. Okay? And it, it, no one's going to be duped. It's a choice that people make. And again, I believe the church isn't here at the time. It's already been spared. So I just love to do that with you. I love to when you, people ask me questions, I love to show you how I believe it's going to play out based on my experience, right? Uh, Exodus 9, right, in the Old Testament, the plague of the boils. You see some similarities here. But the children of Israel in Egypt were spared from the plague of the boils. So here you also see that those that didn't take the mark of the beast are, spoil, are, are, are spared from having to go through this. And God has sort of an MO, a modus operandi. He does things that we don't expect, but he also does things that are expected based on his character and his goodness. He doesn't punish the righteous with the wicked. So you saw it in Exodus, you're seeing it here. You know, I'm just going to say this in general, is that when you look at the election, there's still some instability in what's, listen, I'm going to get some mileage out of this one. I'm just going to do it because it's current events. Both sides say, I hope my candidate gets in. And there's instability, there's fear, there's anger, because we don't know what happens until the electors sit down and actually vote. But sadly enough, if they don't know the Lord, both parties are going to look at this, and if their candidate doesn't get in, they're going to be frightened. If their candidate does get in, they're going to be happy. But I have, I have to say this, if you're watching and you don't know the Lord, this is going to be a dystopia. You think that if your candidate gets in, that you're, it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be utopia, but without the Lord, this is what you're looking forward to. Now, for those of you who are believers, you're saying, yeah, of course, I know, amen, because I'm not going to be here either. And both parties have their idea of how they want to remake the country and how they want to remake the world. But without Christ, listen, I'm looking forward to the millennial kingdom, folks. And they're not on the ticket. <laughs> so, uh, but when Jesus comes, that's what I'm looking forward. Because I don't care whichever one gets in. One may be worse than the other. But it's Christ's kingdom is the thing that we as Christians look forward to. And sometimes Christians, Christians get distracted here. Verse 3. It says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. So, too, is the second bowl judgment. The sea turns to blood and the creatures die, which wreak ha wreaks havoc on the environment, the fishing industry, and the food supply, right? 
<clears throat> and the biological food chain. Everything is affected by this. You have people that have a political utopia that they're looking for, and many people, millions, fit into that category. You also have those today that if they don't know the Lord, they're looking for an environmental utopia. Everybody has their picture. That, that word utopia, when it was coined, it was a brilliant word, right? It's paradise here. It's what I want to make my paradise look like. But without the Lord, it's not paradise. So you can want your environmental, and listen, I'm, I love the environment, but these things have to take place. So again, when the Lord, when the church is removed, everything's going to start to implode. And as much as human beings are going to fight to save the earth and save the planet and save the oceans, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. Many don't want the millennial kingdom that the Lord will reign in. They want heaven on earth without God. Imagine that. They want God's stuff, but they don't want him. It's this, all these, all, everything you're seeing today has spiritual roots, folks. Now, for those stumbled by this, this is the death throes of the old earth system that's been marred by sin to make way for the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation 8, when you look at the trumpet judgments, see, you can see a progression here, right? You had the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and now you have the bowl judgments, 7, 7, and 7. In Revelation 8, a third would be affected. You, when we, we read that, a third, a third, a third. Here, it seems like it's total. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament in Exodus 7. The Nile turned to blood. Now, some were in denial about this. Uh, you're all awake. Awesome. But the Nile turned to blood, right? Uh, and, and this is important, too, folks, because in America, I, there is a, a, a war for the soul of the United States. And I really don't care about the political part. I care about the spiritual part because in a lot of churches and some considered evangelical churches, they're doing away with the Old Testament. They're replacement theologians. You know, Israel has no place. The Old Testament has no place. I have a severe problem with that because to really even understand Revelation, you have to understand Revelation goes from Genesis all the way to the last prophet, right? You, oh, the Jews and the Christians are separate. No, we're not. We have about two dozen Jewish people that are in this church because it's one. You know, today, everything's about dividing people, dividing, divide and conquer, put people in their demographics. No, no. In the church, we can be diverse. We can be Jewish, and we can have Gentile, Gentile backgrounds. Um, I don't believe in replacement theology. There's a lot of promises that God made to Israel that still haven't come to pass yet. What, do we forget about that? But replacement theologians teach, well, we're, God is done with the Jews in the Old Testament. You can see that play out in some of the things we're seeing in this area this animosity towards Jewish people, the attacks on synagogues. Some of the rhetoric, rhetoric is really frightening when you think about it. It's, it really should have no place in this country or anywhere. But when you start to slowly brainwash people with these ideas, then subconsciously they think, well, who cares about the Jews? You know what I'm saying? Listen, Hasids and some of the ultra-Orthodox, they don't share the same beliefs that I do, but when they were being singled out in New York and New Jersey because they wanted to get together and they wanted to worship together, I supported them. And I've seen even on social media uh, just nasty attacks against They just want to be in their community. They got my support. They don't, I don't have to believe what they believe, but they have a right to, uh, to, and this is America, and things are changing. So there's a lot of stuff going on. In Romans 1, again, I'm bringing everything together here. In Romans 1, the Bible tells us that, the, listen, this was in the first century. It's also carried through for 2,000 years that there would be those in Romans 1 who want to worship the creation and not the creator, right? Worshiping the creation. Again, the, the creation could be earth. The creation could be animals. The creation could be vegetation. It could be a lot of things. But basically, God creates it, but we're supposed to worship the creator. When we worship the creation, we, our priorities have, are out of line. Two, year, two weeks ago, I had a, a surgeon who had a scalpel and a whole bunch of stuff, and I was dead as a doornail. I was out, and he was cutting me open, and he was doing all kinds of stuff to me and, and my guts. Uh, but 
I was impressed by him, not the scalpel that he used. I mean, if he gave it to some person who didn't go through med school and said, hey, why don't you try this? I'd be terrified. I would, if I was awake, I'd, get, I'd run out there with that gown with my, my butt hanging out. I'd be out of that place, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, don't give the scalpel to him. It isn't about the scalpel. It's about the surgeon. Scalpel could be a disaster in somebody's hands. It's the same thing with God. The creation is amazing, even in its fallen state, because of the one who created it. But there are today people who love the earth, who worship Mother Earth. They worship nature, but they, they have a disdain and an animus towards God. That system's not going to last much longer. And trust me, don't, I, don't, I don't have a fatalistic view because I... I do care about the environment. I raise bees. My wife is a master gardener. You, you could almost say, in some respects, we're tree huggers. I actually love trees. Um, and I don't even want to take them down until I'm sure that I'm sure that I'm sure that they're dead. You know, I want them to live naturally. But I don't worship them. You see the difference, folks? We're not fatalistic. But we're, we prioritize. God has to be first. If God says to me, son... Where will you see what I'm going to do? I have to let this old system run its course. And I know it's going to be hard to watch, son. God's speaking to me. <clears throat> but when you see what I'm going to do in this new kingdom, you, you, trust me, you're not going to have any... I have to trust him. I have to trust him. Verse 4, continuing on, 4 through 7. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying... You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar, I'm going to do this one last, saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So the third one, three, is the bowl judgments. So we see <clears throat> blood on the rivers and the springs of water, uh, causes excessive thirst, and you see a little bit of a soliloquy here in verses 5 through 6 where the angel of the waters is praising God. The angel of the waters. You know, in the, in the uh, gospel, in the gospels, the Lord speaks about the little ones, the vulnerable ones, how they have angels that always see the face of God, and they, they're there, and, and they're they're assigned to these little ones. Here we see the angel of the waters. We have no idea, because they're invisible, what we're going to see in God's kingdom. I mean, probably for all eternity, we're gonna be, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. He's, God's going to have to tell me, will you just let somebody else ask a question, Joe? Just take it easy. Just relax for a bit. All right, Lord, all right, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'll be like a three-year-old. But So the angel of the waters is praising God, saying he's righteous, but the angel's assigned to the waters, and God is ruining his waters. But what does that tell you? The angel of the waters is trusting God. Again, we read some things in the Bible, and we stumble through it. And this is why when you come to a Bible-teaching church, if you've come from one of these preachers who just tells you everything you want to hear, you actually have to apply yourself to understand the Scripture. Right? A, a preacher who just tells you good things all the time because they want you to send a check, that's not a preacher. You know what I'm saying? We've got, we got to go through the whole Bible. There's some, church, there's some ministries that won't teach Revelation. They just refuse to. It's too controversial. It's God's Word. It's controversial. It's one of five works that the Apostle John wrote. If you don't have a problem with John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you shouldn't have a problem with the book of Revelation. You can't pick and choose what you want to take from God's Word and what you want to discard. It's all there. It's all God's word. But God is righteous. And again, some people have a struggle with this, right? Now, let me just say this, that even today we, we hear the term justice a lot, and people have a selective form of justice. So it doesn't matter which side I choose first, because I'm going to get somebody emailing me or texting me before I even finish what I'm saying, because People are just, they're not applying themselves. They're not praying through the message. So when you look at both parties, Republicans and Democrats, um, both have a different idea of what justice looks like, don't they? So if you look at more on the right, their form of justice is I'm for law and order. I support the police. I support the Constitution. And you know, it's amazing. I just had a conversation with somebody recently. The, the Lord opened the doors and maybe he's watching now. It was such a great conversation. And he's frustrated by what he sees in, in this country. 
And I actually had to sit him down and say, bro, as moral of a person as you think you might be, if you don't have Jesus, you're still not getting to heaven. And he was shocked but intrigued. And he got his wife involved. And I almost ended up witnessing to him on Facebook. And I gave him a Bible. And when I met with him, it was so emotional. He's like, I, I didn't know these things. So you can think that you're a moral person. You can think that you believe in justice. But if you have one sin that's not accounted for, you have fallen short of the glory of God and you will not get into his kingdom. So let's look at the left. You look at the right, you look at the left. The left has an idea too. You know, it's amazing if the right and the left would just work together. This would be a, a rocking country. Because if you take the, the good from both parties, and including libertarians, I like them. Government off, leave me alone government. I want to live my life freely. I like libertarians too. But the left says, you know, we're for social justice. We're social justice warriors. We believe in the downtrodden. We believe in the oppressed. But it's the same thing. And I talk to my friends on the left, and I say, if you don't have Jesus Christ, that's nice that you did all those things. But your one sin will separate you from the kingdom of heaven. You will be separated eternally from a living and loving God. So right and left, they do have uh, a common ground in the fact that if they don't know Jesus, they're both going to spend the same place together. And they're not going to like being in eternity with, with each other probably. But there is a, an element of, of the lake of fire and, and the loneliness that people are actually spread out. So we don't want anybody to go there. So I, I don't mind wading into controversy if it means that I can reach people. And I don't care. They could spit on me. They could be angry with me. They could not like what I say. But I'm going to try my darndest because I know I see what's going on. There is a spiritual darkness covering this country. And we as Christians need to mobilize. We need to mobilize. I love the prayer walks. I love seeing churches after all the, the insanity is gone that they just quietly go and they walk through the neighborhoods and they're just praying. Who knows what the effects of that will be? God will show us in eternity. I believe it. We, gotta, we have to readjust our thinking, right? In verse 6, the earth in the tribulation, which is the earth's future, but you already see the groundwork being laid for it, is knowingly and purposefully, used legal terms, spilling the blood of saints or the average citizen is turning a blind eye to it. A blind eye to what's going on. You know, in, in Germany, where the concentration camps were, within a few miles there were towns. And the allies came and they forced those people to walk and walk past the camps. And no doubt some of them knew what was going on. They heard the trains, they saw what was going on, but they, hey, it's not me, they turned a blind eye. And it happens in communism too. You know, if all those people rose up against the fascist communist government, they could overthrow it, right? But there's something to be said that you can control people if everyone individually thinks as long as they're not coming after me. You also see that in mob rule and mob mentality. Well, in this case, God is basically saying, and he's righteous, he's saying that there's something to be said for those of you that are watching the believers being rounded up, being put in camps, being murdered, being, having their blood spilled, and you do nothing about it. So everyone is going to suffer in this, <clears throat> in this scenario, and there'll be blood to drink, you know, Verse 8, let me just go back. In Revelation 8, so I'm pulling in from Exodus, I'm pulling in from Revelation, I'm pulling in from Romans. In, in Revelation 8, when we looked at the trumpet judgments, we saw that there was a third of the water wave. So some of it, sort of like in Egypt, it, it went away and they were able to drink it again. Here it seems like it's, it's everywhere. No matter where you go, you, there's this situation, there's not pure water to drink. Um, and... <laughs> You know, sometimes I, I put in my notes, should I even say this? Well, time will tell. When I was 19, I had all four wisdom teeth pulled out. Two were sideways. They had to break them. It was just a bloody mess. And uh, they, had, they stitched me up. I went to bed. I woke up, and my mouth was filled with gelled blood. And it was absolutely disgusting. And I, I, was, I didn't want to gag and throw up because then I didn't want to rip the stitches, but... I couldn't wait to get to the sink and get pure water and get that stuff out of my mouth. Blood is an awesome thing when it's in the blood vessels. It's a healer. Blood is awesome. You can't live without it. But if it's in your mouth, it's vile. And this is the situation here. So if you just had breakfast and you're a little queasy, I apologize. I will stop at this point. 
All right? But understand that the world rejected the living waters of Christ only to take the water of death. And again, God gives many chances, many chances. We read a few chapters ago about the angel. You know, God stops the judgments, and the angel is flying through the heavens, preaching the gospel to all of earth's inhabitants. Can we be a stubborn people? Listen, I'll put myself in that category. I probably had about, oh, at least a dozen people when I was young witness to me over different periods, and <clears throat> maybe it was 15, maybe it was 20, before I actually gave my heart to the Lord. We as human beings can be very, very stubborn. And then I, I say to myself, man, I should have done this 10 years ago or more. My life would have gone a little bit better or smoother. But I had to do it Joe's way, of course. Warren Wiersbe says this, and you see a lot of these reflective principles in the scripture. He said, Pharaoh had the Jewish babies drowned in Egypt, and then God drowned Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Mordecai wanted to use the, the gallows to hang the Jews, but he ended up hanging on his own gallows. King Saul refused to slay Amalek, so the, an Amalekite slew King Saul. You see these reflective principles? Here, the saint's blood was shed by an enlightened post-Christian society, and only what was available for them to drink was blood. Doesn't matter how rich you are, how wealthy, everybody was in the same boat. So, and I shouldn't say it was, because will be, because this is a future occurrence. I'll say this too, that, and, and I've heard this not a lot, but I've, it's almost like a cool thing for people to say, and I, I said this in my opening, is that some say, well, I'd rather go to hell because I'll party with my friends there. Listen, if that's what you think, you better read the scripture and make sure this is really what you want. Saul Alinsky, who's the father of modern chaos in the United States, said in an interview with Playboy magazine, he probably thought he was being cute, he was being interviewed by Playboy, he said that when he dies, he prefers to go to hell. There'll be people there like him. Well, he had a massive heart attack at 63, and I'm sure he got his wish, and I wonder if they could send a journalist there and ask him, hey, what's it like? Do you think this is a really great idea? I'm sure he'll have regrets for all of eternity. In verse, and there's, he's, there's a lot of famous people who said stupid things like that. Verse 7, he says, And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Now, I believe that this was part of the tribulation saints. Remember, many of them were martyred. They were killed. Their blood was spilled. So what? They went right to be with the Lord. And when he speaks about them from the altar, we go back in Revelation, and when we covered the tribulation saints in, in Revelation 6 and 7, we see that they were under the altar. And then they came out from under the altar, and they're praising and rejoicing um, when the, the martyrdom stops. So I can see one of them from the altar saying, yeah, you know, the angel says, you're great, you're righteous, and the tribulations are saying, yeah, yeah, we feel the same way too. Because not only did they get to heaven, but they also had, they, they were revenged. They were avenged. Continuing on, verse 8. 8 and 9, it says, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So four out of five is the fourth bowl judgment. You know, we hear a lot about global warming. Well, this is going to be the sun on nitrous oxide. This is going to be the sun on steroids. You know, I, I used to love going out, and you, the sun is just the right temperature, right, in, in, the, in the terms of stars. It's not too hot of a star, if you ever study stars, right? But it's not too cold of a star. I love the S-U-N. It's beautiful. It's bright. Even in the wintertime, you can feel the warmth on your face. But the thing that we adore so much, the S-U-N, is now going to be turned into a blowtorch. A blowtorch. And I think this strikes at the heart of those that worship creation without worshiping God, the creator. You want to worship creation? Well, the creation is going to be very unpredictable in these times. You're going to have a love-hate relationship with the things of creation. In Revelation, we see a finely tailored universe being tweaked to break down. The sun, uh, the third of it, it doesn't give its light. You know, it, it seems like the power goes away uh, from the sun, but here it becomes hotter. 
and it, it becomes tormentuous, right? The heat index is much higher. Somebody was telling me about being out in Arizona, and they were, I think they went for a jog, and everybody says out there, they're like, oh, there's no humidity, it's a dry heat. The guy says, I almost died. <laughs> you know, no offense, you can keep your dry heat. I'll take 80s and some 90s, but 117, 100, you can keep that, the, the dry heat. So <laughs> once the sun reaches us, you know, I actually did a study once because I have a wood-burning stove, and my cat, like, I can't be near that thing. It's so hot in the corner, and the cat goes, and she's, I'm like, you're going to be a roast cat. What are you doing? But I did, you know, you know me, I do research, and I found out that cats uh, can take, I don't even know why I'm saying this, they can take <laughs> a much higher um, range of hot and cold than humans can. You realize that in God's animal kingdoms, a lot of animals, I got a, zoo, a zoologist back there, a lot of animals are more resilient than we are in different ways, temperature and such. So the human, the human body can only take so much heat and so much cold before it starts to break down. Uh, so in this in instance, the sun is incredibly intense. Now, I'm not going to go through, I don't want to repeat things in another message, but in Revelation 8, I spoke about the death throes of a star. That's actually quite fascinating, how stars, when they become an unstable, can expand and contract, and the way they, uh, they uh, have their chemical reactions in, in the nucleus start to change. Uh, even our sun, you know, there's different things that happen I used to know all the terms. All right, I'm just going to move on. But just suffice to say that the st stars are unpredictable, and we have a star, and we call it the S-U-N, but don't worship it. Worship the S-O-N, more important. Now, let's go to the preterist view for, the, for my Bible students. The preterist view of Revelation says that these things, everything in Revelation has already happened in history. That's problematic. When you start to read all of Revelation and say these things already happened, when? In what little part of the world did I miss all these things? So I don't agree with the, uh, the preterist view. Remember what I said when we started Revelation in, cha in chapter 1, and I prayed through this book. I'm like, all right, Lord, I, I have a good grasp on Revelation, but if I say one thing wrong in chapter 2 and 3, it's going to come back to bite me in 16, 17, and 18. That's the way, like I said, some places they don't even teach Re Revelation, or they take the coward's view out by saying the preterist view, oh, it all happened, don't worry about it, or they'll take everything symbolic. No nothing means anything. That's a problem, too. So the, the courageous people teach Revelation for the way it needs to be taught. So by 18, 19, 20, and 21, you're not going, oh, no, I said this, and what if they remember it? No, we don't do it like that here. We teach it the way God wants us to learn it. Uh, John Piper, who's been teaching the Bible for literally decades, if you go on his website, there's several chapters in Revelation. He's taught every Bible uh, book, in, book in the Bible but he's omitted several chapters out of Revelation because he can't teach it. Because his view is, he, he boxed himself into, and the guy's a brilliant guy, he boxed himself into a corner that he cannot finish Revelation. I just want a, a little word to, and I know some Christians that do this to me. They come up to me and they just, they're name droppers. Oh, I listen to this famous preacher, I listen to that famous preacher, I listen to this famous preacher. Do me a favor, read your Bible, pray, Get a foundation, but, you know, it doesn't matter if they're a famous preacher. Some of these famous preachers say that nobody gets saved in the tribulation. Well, it's clearly not true based on what we're reading, and we've covered this through many chapters. So, you know, you have just as much of the Holy Spirit than some of these famous preachers. And listen, I'm wrong at times. We can be wrong, you know. Do the research on your own. Have that relationship with God. Let him guide you through it. The Holy Spirit is there for you. Okay, so we've seen in the Revelation judgments th that, that many do repent and get saved, and we've covered this throughout this book, but in this case, they don't. They blaspheme his name. You know what's interesting about this is that they don't say, the people on earth don't say, there is no God. It's a terrible thing that this is happening. This is very uncomfortable. They say, whatever they say, blasphemy cursing against the living God. So today, people say, oh, there is no God. Trust me. In this time period, there's nobody who's an atheist or an agnostic. They know where it's coming from. And I have friends who, are, who fall into that category, and I say to them, you really, you really don't believe that there's no God. 
these are the reasons why you won't follow him, and some of them are honestly admitted. Think about this for a minute. You can't have, and I covered this recently, you can't have randomness and uh, inanimate objects that get together, bump into each other over billions of years, and make thinking human beings. It's not possible. Randomness and inanimate and something that's not a personality cannot make a thinking person. That's why panentheism and pantheism and some in the New Age movement, they're taking very simple things with no thought, with no creativity, with no ability to process, and they're saying, well, that created us. And the New Age is very diverse, so not everybody believes that. You know, in 1950, Miller-Urey had their experiments, and they took uh, amino acids, and they put them together in a lab, and they uh, put sparks, and they try to blow it up, and they try to make, they try to prove, you could check this out, they try to prove that life could arise out of non-life, out of building blocks. Well, there was a few problems. Number one is that every time they lit it on fire, and they did this multiple times, they would get mostly carboxylic acid, which is basically organic goo, okay? Organic goo, even anything living can't live in it because it's not, it can't sustain life. The second problem is Miller and Urey were the catalyst. So I, 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 science has been trying to disprove God since Darwin. And you can't get the lab, put everything together, select the amino acids that you want or the different building blocks and compounds, put it, I want so much of this and, and a little bit of that, and put them together. Okay, now we have to light it on fire. We have to make an explosion. Guess what? You become the catalyst. You, become the, you control everything. So there's two main reasons why, and nobody really talks about the Miller-Urey experiments anymore, but the laboratory, the scientific method, and people say the science, and people are using today science as a bludgeoning stick to get you to believe what they want you to believe. Sci the scientific method is when you observe something, carefully tailored uh, a situation, parameters, in a laboratory, and you do it over and over and over and over and over and over again, and you take notes. That's the scientific method. Nobody has proved anything about the scientific method. So the truth is that people are just angry at God. They have their reasons, or, or and I've met a lot of scientists who are a lot smarter than me. They have a problem with not being the smartest person in the room. If they have to submit to God, there's a pride issue there. If you ever watch the physicists debate, I've watched physicists debate. To some people, it's boring. To me, it's like a cat fight. And they, they yell at each other, and they call, you know, your, your, your model is ignorant. Like, they fight with each other. These are supposed to be the people that we're looking towards for, for science. But it's all about whose theory is more plausible than the other person's. And um, was it Stephen Hawking, the guy who was disabled, the physicist? Thank you. The poor guy, he was disabled, he, was, he had such a disability, and they were merciless to him. Just look it up, check it out. These are the people that we're trusting ourselves to that don't believe in God. So they already have an idea, or they already ha have a, a postulation that God doesn't exist, so now they have to do everything looking through that lens. But in this time, nobody thinks that there's no God. They know who's causing that. And again, this strikes at the worship of creation. How dare God not allow rebellious mankind to just be able to enjoy his creation and have him get out? That's what it comes to. 10 and 11, last few verses. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. Now, you have to parse this, okay? In some instances, it's everywhere. In some instances, it's just those who have the mark. In this instance, and we're going to talk more about the Antichrist or the Charismatic Globalist headquarters in the future, okay? So let me read it again. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven 
because their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So five out of five is where we're going to end is the fifth bowl judgment. And I'm going to say this is the judgment of palpable darkness. Palpable darkness. In Exodus 10, it was the plague of darkness. Now, we've all been in places and stubbed our toe, <laughs> right? <laughs> because we couldn't see. We, we, our eyes are so important to us. But how many of us have been in places, I know I have, where literally there was no light? So if you got, go out and you walk at night, sometimes my wife and I like to take a walk at night and just chat, is that there's a street light, or even if the street light is burnt out, there's starlight. You'd be surprised if those stars are not there. But there are certain situations where you can put yourself where you're literally in abject darkness. You cannot see anything. And abject darkness messes with your depth perception. So I'm studying Revelation. I haven't been in Exodus in a while. I go back to Exodus 10.21, and God says, in this plague, there will be a darkness that will be able to be felt. Okay, so go home, do something, put a blindfold on, go in your closet, get somewhere real dark, and then try to move around. Now, someone's going to get hurt, and they're going to sue me and say, well, my pastor, don't do that. But the point is that in situations where I've been in that type of darkness, it feels like the darkness is actually attacking my face and my eyes and my body because abject darkness messes with your depth perception. So in Exodus 10.21, we know today through science that this is the truth. It's as if it's in your face. So in addition to our senses, here, abject darkness is also a negative spiritual experience. It's a harbinger of the lake of fire. And they gnawed their nungs be tongues because of pain. It could have been from the boils in the first bowl, or it could be because they're getting a taste of the lake of fire, or it could be both. Remember, this is only in the headquarters of the beast or the Antichrist. How can it be extremely hot and dark at the same time? You can ask that question and ask, how can the lake of fire burn its occupants, be dark at the same time, and not completely consume or destroy its occupants because the physical properties change? If you look at Genesis and you look at the physical properties in creation, when God speaks about creation, a lot changes from creation, the physical properties, was, was gravity still 9.8 meters per, per second square? Was the pressure of the atmosphere one atmosphere? Probably, but I don't know. However, the biological properties had changed because they were supposed to live forever. When it went from creation to paradise lost, so to speak, to the post-diluvian period or after the flood, everything changed. That's why we don't have dinosaurs anymore walking the earth. Because the, and, and I went through this when I talked about ge uh, Genesis, there's a lot in Genesis. The water canopy, the uh, greenhouse effect, the way it was able to be distributed around the whole earth. That's why they find the woolly mammoth, and they open him up, and he's got vegetation in his stomach. He didn't digest it. He was flash frozen. How could that digest that, those greens still be in there? His hair was not like the hair that people think. It was more frizzy. That would have protected him from the heat, not necessarily a winter coat. When you really start to do the study of the pre-diluvian and post-diluvian periods, you find out that the scientists, again, still don't have the answer for this because they're not looking in Genesis. So we just have to trust God. Let me leave you with this. Spiritual darkness. And there's a lot of reasons why God could have done this. Maybe there was somebody in his headquarters that was just a political person that God wanted them to leave and get saved. It happens. Right? There were those in the Nazi regime and communist regimes that fled. They just fled. They just realized how evil it was. But there's also a spiritual darkness of our culture. And right now, churches are okay. But when you start preaching the things of God and, and you know, Jesus is the only way, then people get uncomfortable. So church is okay, but church is... It's not monolithic. It's a, it's a broad spectrum understanding. Once you start getting into saying, well, I believe in the veracity of the scripture. Well, I believe that Jesus is the only way. Sometimes, you know, you, you, your professionals, your peers might look at you differently. But there's more of an antagonism 
You know, even if you talk to strangers, I like to witness to people, and I'm nice, I'm pleasant. But when you start talking about the depth of the word, sometimes they get very uncomfortable. And it's spiritual. Jesus was, you know, even unbelievers, when they read about Jesus, oh, he was such a nice guy, I would love to meet him. So then why are his words a problem for you? Christians, there's a lot of Christians today, and I get frustrated with this, that are going along with the majority. And the majority in our culture, a lot of it is saying for us to compromise our beliefs. In order to get along with everybody else and where the world and the culture is going, don't be so... When I told a friend of mine who was a friend a long time that I named my son Josiah because he was a great king in the Old Testament, he goes, he actually said to me, why can't you, why you got to be like that, you Christians? Why don't you just name him something normal? Like, you know, he's, maybe he'll get picked on. I'm like, bro, Josiah was an awesome king in the Old Testament. And this was my friend. So little things that you do because you love the Lord, you love his word, you love the history, even those that are close to you will give you a hard time for it. I always say this to Christians that are listening. When you find that you're always in the majority and you're always agreeing with what they say on TV, and you're always agreeing with people who don't know God, tell us how to worship God, because you don't want to be ostracized. You don't want to be insulted on social media. You want to go along to get along. You start compromising your beliefs. And there's going to be people, I, I have no doubt, there'll be churches, and people will be incited in after the rapture comes, in the seven-year tribulation. Because, you know, they never really totally gave their heart to the Lord. You know, they, they didn't want to be so heavenly-minded that they, they were no earthly good, these expressions. Actually, the more heavenly-minded you are, the more earthly good you are. Because you know what? You care about people that nobody else does. You care about people that can't pay you back. You care about people that you'll never see again. That's what we do as Christians. Because Jesus says, don't you let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I know people in this church that do amazing things when they leave these doors. And I'll never find out about it. And that's fine. Because I'm not their judge. God is. But do we, do we believe that when we trust in Jesus, we are filled with the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit does give us power? Do we believe that Jesus said, if you love me, you'll follow my word? not what the academia is trying to tell us what to follow and what to reject. This time is coming, and that's why <laughs> my, my doctor, too, I went to my, my appointment with my wife, and I'm like, I know, I'm not a good patient. He goes, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're not supposed to. Doc, I got things to do, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I'm trying to witness to him, too, and he, he doesn't know the Lord yet. But my thing is, there's work to be done. Jesus says that the daylight is only so long and then the darkness comes. We have to work while there's daylight. There's a lot of people who are hurting. They're frustrated. They're angry. They're, and, and God may call on you and me to, to just get them to think differently out of, out of Republicans and Democrats, out of this world and into reality, which is eternity, because this isn't going to last. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, you're so awesome. You're so good to us. Lord, you know, you, in a way, we should be flattered that you even want to use us. And, you know, if we really understood all of your word, we would want to be used more. You know, you, you could use the angels, you could use the saints in heaven, but you choose to use us while we're still in sinful flesh on this earth. I just pray, Lord, I pray that there's just so much division in our country. I pray that we could sift through... That, Lord, we all, I have my opinions, we all have our opinions, but that we would prioritize Jesus over all other things and put everything else second, third, fourth, and all the way down the line. I just pray if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, or you have your head bowed, is there anybody here who they just want to give their heart to Jesus? I would just ask you to walk up to the front right now. I'll lead you in a prayer. Maybe somebody will come up with you. You know, it, it, the word is powerful. If you were moved by the sermon, honestly, you weren't moved by me. You were moved by what I read. Because I could read any book and you won't be moved. But I'm reading the Word of God. So while the worship team leads us in worship, if you don't know the Lord and you want a desire to walk with Him, you come up here. And the Bible says that the angels will be rejoicing. They already know what's going to happen before you get up. So you come forward.
Is there anybody who'd like to come forward and give their heart to Jesus Christ? If you don't fully understand what that means after service, please don't leave until you talk to me about that. Um, and I would just say for anybody who's watching, our online ex audience has uh, expanded tremendously. So I just want to lead you in a prayer if you're there and you're sitting in your PJs or you're in the living room watching TV or the computer screen. I just want to lead you. Just repeat after me. And as you'll notice, I don't have a script. From Sunday to Sunday, my words are different because it isn't a formula. It's about where your heart is. So just if you are home and you want to receive Jesus, just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I trust that you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins and that you've promised me an abundant life here and especially in eternity. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I look forward to walking with you all the days of my life and beyond. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Pretty cool. Let's all stand for worship.